go live live yes we're going live we're live and uh, uh, a few minutes late but uh, yeah um, a few minutes late but here and just gonna a bit shell shocked, actually. Anyone shell shocked? <laughs> uh, I I realize I am every once in a while, but uh, you know, um, I uh, searching for words really. Steve Hershey is here. Wow, that is. Um, Kevin Ritchie is here. Which sorry, Kevin, I'm late. I know Kevin was sitting here at 2.57 and feeling like he was late. So uh, thank you, my dear friend, for keeping me honest. You know, I almost skipped out on this show today. I'll start there just to kind of set the stage. I'm just in, in a little bit of a weird space. I've, like anyone else, I've had my ups and downs <laughs> with this, this uh, time period and it's um but this show is therapeutic you know it's it's i i i have to look it up but um i'm i'm somewhere around a year of doing this either two or three weeks plus or minus um but you know it really it does it's 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 form of meditation you know i'm a big fan of uh meditation as an idea i don't do it enough and i've done years ago some of the the kind of classic meditation that that we think of which is the um silence sitting in a room maybe in a lotus pose or or sitting in a chair or alvin lucier i am sitting in a room or um but 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 that kind of classic type of meditation um and i do that i try to do that once a day at least i'm trying to go for more times per day to just go sit outside sit outside in the front or the back of the house and sit and, and listen to birds and sunlight on your skin, vitamin D. Um, I, I can't remember where I read it, but there's something about sunlight, the actual um, the quality of sunlight going into our eyes. I, 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 I got to look this up, but I remember reading years ago with humans that there's, there's some, I don't know if it's endorphins or some kind of, chemical process that that um just like sunlight hitting our skin helps us synthesize you know different vitamins i think vitamin d and some other stuff but um something about sunlight going into your eyes it, it, there's something that we need it, it, it helps brain health and kind of so I, I that's one of my meditations to try to go outside sit outside take some time with with my phone not there and uh birds we live in a temperate rainforest i almost said tropical a temperate rainforest which is the specific kind of um um uh i forget the word um um losing my mind here but the the, the meteorological definition uh, that you have of you know this specific you know uh, words have meaning, <laughs> which is one of my themes th this this day, this week, this lifetime. But but so you have meanings for word. What's a desert? There's a clear definition of that. Um, what's 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 a uh, wetland? You know what? Uh, you know all these things. What are what's a tundra? So so rainforests. There's a couple different types. And amazingly, I I was. A few years older, a few years younger when I found out we have a rainforest in the USA. And I live in one. Wow. So it's a temperate rainforest here in uh, the Appalachians in western North Carolina. A few years ago, we had the second most rain in the United States. Number one was Hilo, Hawaii. We were number two. So I'm, I'm acutely um, appreciative of that in these times of drought and wow stuff some parts of the planet there's floods and, and and too much water distribution and other places uh 
as we're watching in the Southwest. Wow. Some of you might be saying, oh, I wanted to hear about the new Beyond Burger today. And we will we'll talk about that stuff. And I love, tell me what you ate today. Tell me what you had. Let's talk about taking one day a week and adjusting our diet by just that much. Think about it. All I'm proposing is one-seventh of your week to just say, well, what can we do? You know, I love asparagus. I haven't had it in years. Why don't we have that tonight? And a nice salad. And, and that, that bag of potatoes, has been, it's, it's not going to cook itself. And, you know, I have some lentil soup frozen from your mom. And, wow, there's a meal, you know. And um, so that's what I'm here to just humbly try to inspire and share um, to take one-seventh of your week. Just one seventh, you know, um, just just 52 Mondays a year, right? What's the math on that? <laughs> 52 out of uh, 365, uh, what does that break down? Someone can do the math for me. Um, somewhere under one-fifth, uh, you know, uh, um, somewhere under one-sixth even. So, um, uh, but th- the point is, uh, uh, just a sliver, just, just a... One tiny thin mint. That's all. Just one, one mint. Um, but Monty Python. For those of you who don't remember that. Um, but but so it, it, it. I'm just trying to put some connective tissue here, because it all comes back to our everyday choice. What I'm talking about, climate change, which I I haven't termed it that, but that's what I'm talking about when I talk about when I mention the Southwest and the Wow, incredible conditions. Are y'all looking at this? Arizona, Nevada, Colorado even, you know, um, as high uh, altitude as a lot of that state is. California, wow. I mean, they're, wow, the wildfires. If half of the predictions are correct this year, holy shit, it's going to make last year look, you know, kind of timid. Uh, uh, Australia's faced a few years of incredible heat and fires and just so so what does this have to do with any of this Andre um well leading our resource um uh usage and this has been true for decades folks for decades far and away it's the now, listen carefully, because someone's going to get mad and say, you know, well, I like meat, and that's that. Take a deep breath. It's, you know, it's not the point. Listen carefully. For decades, we've been able to tie, this is the part to put quotes around, we've been able to tie the mechanized, industrialized, right? The large-scale mechanized machine of uh, 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 raising, uh, for, what's the first word I should use? Um, um, I'm forgetting the word right now. Early Alzheimer's. But but, but anyway, the, the, the breeding, that's the word I'm looking for. The breeding, the raising, the feeding, the drugging, the extreme inoculating, the extreme steroidal treatment of, and finally, the slaughter of animals. Listen to me carefully. I'm saying on the scale that 90-some percent of it it's done at, the massive industrialized factory scale is what I'm addressing. I know your uncle has goats and and the meat's delicious and all that. Oh, I'll take a deep breath. I get so angry hearing that. It's crap, really, because it's... I don't even know what the math is. It's point oh oh something of 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 the situation, um, and so I applaud that. I do. And you, anyone that's been here and I'm celebrating a, a year of this knows that I do. I do. I I applaud every week that if you choose to eat the flesh of animals, let's talk about it. We can have a separate kind of thing. But if you're going to and you are getting it organic from that farmer 20 minutes away from that farm market where it's an ethically raised humanely uh pasture fed no uh, 
added steroids, no, all of these, you know, there's a, a bunch of um, descriptive terms. And some, and there's a mix and match, right? I, I mean, as you know, I've been a natural foods professional f- for, um, it was it was almost 20 years and, and co-owning a natural food store for over a decade. But I feel like really I've never been out of it. Yeah, I've always been an advocate. I've done, when I didn't co-own a store, I went on to do lectures in retirement centers, hospitals, schools, county colleges, high schools, grade schools, about nutrition, about natural foods, about optimizing your immunity. Um, My point there is just to say that throughout that time, I've consistently said, hey, let's be qualitarians, right? That's actually more important than being a vegetarian or what's some of the other words, a pescatarian or a... a, um, uh, opportunitarian I've heard yeah there's people who stay veg unless they're at their sister's house and she's making that great shrimp salad uh, I've always said qualitarian maybe you know ponder that being the top of the pyramid and what that means is insisting on quality paying more for quality and saying no when you don't have that quality so in other words just stop eating junk food the fast food that the crap at you know the, the 10 big chains because it's the worst shit on earth. It's the GMO corn. It's the GMO tomatoes. It's the high fructose corn syrup. It's the animal flesh with 40 hormones stuck into it. Growth hormones, steroids, all these things. The artificial coloring, the the, the bun has 75 ingredients in it, right? Um, so so when, when we try to be qualitarians, it's just saying, you know, if you're going to have a burger, you know... Um, Pay twice as much. Get that fresh ground stuff that, that's the Whole Foods, as, as many issues as we may have with them, or at your local place, or at the Amish place if you live in Pennsylvania, Ohio, New York, where you can go get um, uh, the Amish I just mentioned because they're spread far and wide, and, and they've got a really good uh, interface with the rest of society for organic food. They are hardcore. They will not, right, because of their religious um, relationship with reality. They don't want to hear anything about these chemicals and steroids and antibiotics. And they, so, so the Amish um, are an awesome people to, um, if you live again in, you know, where a big chunk of the United States population lives, not far from the Amish. If right, if you count up Pennsylvania, New York State. Ohio and a few other places. Um, but, you know, any way that you can find some better food, be a qualitarian. Be a qualitarian. Say no to that fucking soda and that, you know, artificially flavored, you know. Um, we all love a treat. We all love whatever, sweet stuff or a bowl of ice cream or, a, you know, but but let's read labels. Let's, let's just say, you know what, time to try some of these other things with a better quality. So so I I'm, I just want to remind us of that, that, that if we start with quality, you end up automatically kind of reducing the stuff that I've framed this around, the, um, the factory-raised, kind of industrialized, you know, uh, uh, animal products. As you know, I'm not a huge fan of the factory manufactured um massive supply chain vegetarian food either right we we talk about this all the time here I, i'm consistent that i'm not telling people start buying the soya packaged food and just eat that i had a discussion with someone yesterday on instagram where uh, it's like you know these people that think that health food people that's all we eat we just eat frozen not dogs or something. (laughs) It's fucking hilarious. You know, um, no, we eat apples and pears and grapefruits and cherries and cherimoyas and pineapples and coconuts and we eat whole grains and we eat quinoa and brown rice and wild rice and squashes and, you know, uh, uh, on and on, black beans and red beans and white beans and lentils and we eat mushrooms and onions and scallions and seaweed and hijiki and spirulina and tempeh and... And we eat food. We eat 
plants, and there's millions of them. Kale, collards, chard, dandelion greens, bok choy, uh, the arugula, uh, on and on and on. This is what most of the tens of thousands of natural foods people I've encountered as customers since 1990 or so, that's mostly what they eat, percentage-wise. I, I look at their shopping carts. Sure, absolutely. Every once in a while, you get someone who, who's kind of in that cycle where they do eat nothing but packaged food. And, and that's true, whatever people eat, right? But I think that's important, too, to, to, to understand that when we advocate health food, I, I don't even like that term, but when we advocate natural food, we're not saying go fill your cart with a bunch of uh, 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 Amy's pot pies or I can't even think of names, Worthington, you know, Smart Links or um, Gardein fish fillet simulations. And, you know, that stuff in a tiny percentage with the big shopping cart of all the stuff I just said, the asparagus and the mangoes and the, you know, the cabbages and the, the leeks and all the wonderful, amazing, sustainable foods is, um, I think, at least one possible kind of path. So there's my monologue. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and then uh, I'm going to shut up and kind of hear from you now. And then um, let's go to my uh, – let's do some production here. Let's go to my uh, – Let's see who's on YouTube. Uh, anyone on YouTube? There's always a couple people, which I appreciate. Lee Gollin is usually there. Jen is usually there. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, let's first off mute myself so I don't. Um, and um, by the way, please subscribe and like on my YouTube if you're. A YouTube person. I'm trying to build the YouTube. I don't talk about this enough. I don't promote myself enough. <laughs> I've been reminded by by two or three people this weekend. Um, I just have a lot of fun getting on doing this, but I really got to dial in. Um, a friend of mine told me I've got to get a QR code. You know what that is? The little. I, they work great though, because then people are at your concert or which I just started, or uh, on your chats like this and you just put it on the screen um okay let's uh where's my facebook uh people um let's see because i know you're there and i i've seen kevin ritchie i've seen steve hershey um let's jump in um it's a party let's see a temporary you were temporarily hear my because I know you're there and I I've seen Kevin Rich there we go okay awesome hello everyone um so Kevin thank you so much my friend I, I can't tell you how thankful I am that you um share a, a bit of your Monday w with me and and it, it's an honor it's an honor and many times it's been you and me bud for you know a, a bit of time and um but you're always, uh, an, you know, uh, if not the first person, you're always an early arrival. And um, I I just want to say I appreciate that because it, it, it gives me, um, you all do, give me a, some purpose to, to be doing this and some sense of like, okay. And I always have a, a philosophy of just one person, just one person, right? It's that um, each one teach one. There's a lot of sayings that are corny about that idea but i embrace that and as a someone who's i'm currently a music teacher i teach guitar and theory i have one bass student and i've had a couple synthesizer students um it, just one person the joy to share something that you can help people understand uh before you leave this earth just as i look for that every day i'm always looking to understand some new shit that's one of our topics today. So thank you, Kevin, because you thank you all. But thank you, especially Kevin, because you're just consistently there and, and make great points, great questions. I see you have a heart procedure coming up. Oh, cardiologists are irresponsible. I'm sorry to hear that. Might survive. 
Oh, so sorry. So sorry. That's frustrating to hear. That's it. <laughs> a wafer thin mint. Exactly. Exactly. Um, Lynn Zawada, how are you, my friend? Lynn Zawada, and I, I've said it before to people. Lynn's already blushing, but my big crush when I was um, – how old was I? <laughs> Robin's going to slap me, but no, it, this was like 45 years ago. Um, uh, I don't know, Lynn, but great to see you here. And uh, Lynn's house was right near the bus stop, so she she could show up last and just run through the woods, wait for the bus to arrive, probably from the breakfast table. Oh, there's the bus. But um, how are you, Lynn Zawana? And uh, I'm struggling with what year that would have been. Uh, who knows? 78, 79, 80. So, um, all right. Great to see you, my friend. And um, Lynn still looks great because she's healthy and she's eating good organic food and being uh, in, in Florida, you know. Um, so, uh, helps with depression. I was going to say, what? wow, how uh, timely because I've fought depression many times years in my life and you know um had some <sighs> sailing through some stuff the last week or two which i've had a really good last year right with like many human beings on earth a lot of curling up in a ball and like existential dread and what the fuck what happens next which leads to depression i lost my career i lost what would have been the busiest year of my life last year with all my um, the touring collapsing, you know, I lost tours from two tours from Yes. I lost a Brand X tour. I lost a Ricky Lee Jones tour. I lost um, the biggest one I would have oh, celebrating David Bowie. And then the biggest one I lost so far in my life, I was going to go out with Poison. Yeah, I was going to be on a state, my first stadium tour. With Poison, who I'd worked for, you know, uh, C.C. DeVille changing his guitars. But it was Joan Jett, who I love, Poison, who is okay. I'm not, like, the biggest fan, but they got some cool stuff. Def Leppard, who I loved their early stuff. And Motley Crue, who, uh, you know, a couple songs. But I was so looking forward to um, to being at, at, at this summer-long thing of of um you know ill-fitting spandex and you know housewives with hairstyles that maybe should have gone away and uh, uh um you know uh stretchy t-shirts and boots that are ill-fitting and that's just the band <laughs> okay so <laughs> i was i was i was really looking forward to that though and and so I have a sense of humor of it now, but I tell you, man, I, <laughs> oh man, I lost so much. I couldn't believe it. I was like, in January, like, oh my God, I'm going to pay so many bills and <laughs> get out of debt. Uh, you know, all these dreams of um, sugar plums were dancing in my head. So I'm sobered by the loss and a lot of depression, man. There's some fucking dark borderline suicidal shit man when you you when it when it got going right it's not a joke so um so lynn right helps with depression i think you were talking to talking about uh sunlight i think right because that's about what i was talking about 20 minutes ago um yeah sunlight and going outside and turn the fucking devices off so um good to see you here and thanks for reminding me of that uh Benny Rodriguez, how are you, my friend? Happy World Music Day. Is it today? Oh, every day is World Music Day here and in your house. But, uh, okay, I'll challenge accepted. Thanks, my bro. Um, and tra, for those of you who don't know, that's how you pronounce that. Tra, roll that R in there. Kevin Ritchie says, small fires in the Columbia River Gorge. Wow. Smoky haze. Hey, Laura Darty, How are you, my dear friend? I'm more tolerant than you. Uh, okay. Uh, about about what? Because <laughs> I'm not so tolerant. 
This is all an act. <laughs> you, uh, I love you. You need to – let's get you on the show. We keep saying that, but you know what? I come off this show, and I just go, boop, I'm into another world. I'm teaching later that day or the next morning, or I'm editing – six hours of video or I'm preparing for an interview, which I do every week, or I'm doing this or that. So I kind of turn it off and I forget, but I'd love to schedule on again. Um, maybe next week. Cause if I can get Kelly on, then we'll do like a Jersey thing, you know? Um, so let's talk anyway. Um, went to Riverview and you brought tofu cheesecakes to a lecture. Yes. Right. That's right. We did. We did a lecture together. We did a couple, um, Let's see. Isn't this about being meatless? Yes, it is. Eat Susan and Susan have a mess together, but don't worry about being plant-based and getting away. Yes, it is, my friend. It, it, absolutely. And uh, um, I'm always going to put that into context. Uh, yeah, and, and my ultimate goal is yes, I want people to just quit slaughtering, breeding, poisoning, artificially impregnating, torturing imprisoning in difficult situations and ultimately slaughtering animals that's my dedication i'm just being a bit diplomatic that if you just can't see that path then at least let's meet halfway and up the quality so that your children have a water supply in your state because you're not paying the pig slaughtering industry to keep destroying your rivers and lakes so uh, um, you know that discussion people have heard a lot so um but yeah thanks always please remind me and keep me honest that it's about being meatless yeah um okay laura says she just came off the seven day lemon fast on a mission to educate people it's not necessary to eat meat or dairy no it's not animal flesh no don't need it um, I'm training myself to not say meat because that that kind of masks it's slaughtered animal muscle, slaughtered animal flesh. Wow, so much more dramatic, right? Because that's absolutely what it fucking is, you know. Um, it's it's I love language. Anyone who knows me knows that I love it. I, I just not a day that I'm not in a discussion and or debate about <laughs> language and what words mean and how. Words have meaning, and, 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 but at the same time, yin yang, words evolve and they change and stuff. To that point, quite recently, I've heard people, instead of saying slaves, say enslaved people. Wow, that rang like a bell for me. And I was like, wow. So now I never say slaves. If I'm talking about the black African descendants of, 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 of people in, or even the first arrived slaves in the 1600s. There it is. I just said it. The, 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 the newly arrived enslaved people or the ones right before the end uh, in the 1860s. Now, when I refer to them, I don't say, oh, the, the slaves in Galveston, Texas, etc. Et I now, thanks to other people, because I listen and learn every day. That's my kind of top level goal. Uh, I seek to, and, and I, I think I feel like I do on, on, on most good days. But that one's a big one. I, I, I don't say slaves anymore because it, it puts it on the person. Like, that's their definition. No, we're human beings. We've been enslaved. So I love that. So I'm training myself to not say meat and to say, you know, sorry. Animal flesh, animal muscle, slaughtered. Just like your dog and your cat has that you caress and that you take to the doctor. If you feel the slightest bump, if the slightest bump, you're petting your cat. You're sitting on the couch. You're watching Netflix, petting that cat. Oh, what, what's that on my cat's forearm? That weird, oh, that's nasty. Feels like a, oh, I shouldn't squeeze that. that. The cat just pulled back. What do you do? You take the cat to a vet. And if it's $200, $500, $1,000, if you have it, you're spending it, right? Think about that disconnect. Yet that muscular area of that living animal that would struggle for its life if it detected a, a life-threatening um, predator activity, 
that would claw your eyes out to survive if it, if it felt the threat, if it smelt the, the adrenaline of, of its impending death. Right? That animal is not that far off from the pig, the cow, the goat, that you'll happily... You know, so, so it's animal flesh, and that's what I'm going to call it, and that's what I advocate people call it. So, um, so Laura, very wise words you're saying, and you're right. Um, and we're not here to judge. Yeah, I, I, you know, while I'm fine with judgment, you know, I, I have a lot of discussions with a couple of my friends, actually. But one friend recently about judgment, which we struggle with, I think, in sort of under the Judeo-Christian umbrella, we're always told... Uh, let he cast the first stone and let the only judge be. We have all this stuff about judging that I think is weird. And judging is fine. We make judgments every day. <laughs> we cross the street when shady looking characters are between us and the ATM. You know, we, we, we sniff food in the fridge and we make a judgment. And, and we also say, I don't like the way my sibling is treating me or my parent is treating me. I'm judging them because it's not right. So anyway, uh, I know what you're saying, though, Laura. Not here to judge, but it's a fine line, right, when we're talking about all this dietary stuff. And when other people's choices affect us. That's where it gets tricky. Yeah. So you're here to educate. So am I. Exactly. Your clarity's open. Your heart wants to share. I love it, Laura. And I applaud that. So please stick around and conversate with me here a little bit more today. Ryan Walsh, how are you, my friend? Good to see you. You are awesome. You're an inspiration because uh, every time I see you, I'm reminded that I've known you since you were a kid. And I love you. And I, you know, we're family, actually. And for you um, to have made these changes yourself in these couple years is just, wow, it's great. You know, and you mean business. And you study this stuff, and and I love it. You're passionate, so you're right. You're trying to inform people about the animal slaughter industry and the environment. That's where it, you know, you're right. It's cool and hip to not give a shit. Yeah, that's another thing. I, I don't care, dude. I'm immune. Didn't you hear what George Carlin said? Doesn't matter. Yeah, I've I've dealt with the hip nihilism for for you know forty years. Um. So you're saying cutting those foods, good. It's helped you. You've gotten healthier. Thank you, my bro. I, I, I'm so happy that that you personally have found results. You have found results. Laura, you're thanking Ryan. And Laura, you do know that that is, Ryan is Sherry's cousin, right? That That's, yeah, I, I think you know that, but. That's the connection. I do accept Venmo. Thank you for reminding me. I will put my Venmo here. Um, Selen. Selen. Selen Dora Gunderin. Sorry if I'm saying that wrong. Selen. Selen? I'm so sorry. I, I'm stumbling on some names. But hi, Selen Dora Gunderin. Thanks for stopping by. Um, you're asking about the Impossible Burger. Is it worth trying? Definitely worth trying. Yeah. Um, as I was saying at the top, we're not trying to tell people pack your freezer with these and eat seven a week or no. And that's sometimes I feel like that's what critics are hearing from us. Not at all. Um, but is it worth trying? Yeah, it's great. Here it is summertime. It's part of our culture to be out with friends. And now you can do that safely, uh, and th throw a burger on the grill or, or some, uh, um, whatever sliced onions or some, some shish kebab, of veggies like I had this weekend, stick some mushrooms and hot peppers and cut up squash and cherry tomatoes on a skewer and grill it. This is the time, right? Summer. So, and even when we say throw a burger on the grill, what we've done with language and culture is mask what that really is. I mean, think about it. If everyone every time said, hey, you want me to throw some ground up steroidal, hormone-loaded, huh? Does it have, yeah, well, it's got 30 hormones of its own, but I bought the one where they add another 30, man. This is awesome. But uh, does anyone want a, a, a patty of uh, slaughtered animal flesh and muscle and gristle and bone and pus and blood 
because uh, I'm going to throw a few on the grill. And, um, huh? Oh, totally. This has a Stradio on it, uh, in it. Yes. The, are you kidding me, bro? Progesterone, testosterone, estrogen, because they mix all this stuff in. You, you want two, right? Okay, cool. Uh, if we said that, right, it changes the picture. But that's what a burger is usually. So to answer your question, Selen, um, the word burger is funny because what does it mean? It, it 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 means what I just said normally, but it really means a patty shaped thing that's usually brown or reddish brown or, or all kinds of different depends on what it's made of. But but it's a thing, you know. <laughs> it's about that big. You throw it on the grill. So totally, totally try those. Enjoy that experience. And I, I think they're pretty tasty, and they're high protein, they're low carb, they're all these things that people look for. Um, would I eat one every day? No, no. Um, but they serve an awesome role culturally for us to eat a, a recognizable kind of a food that we've, we've eaten for centuries. They, uh, while at the same time taking a bit out of this chain of industrialized animal foods. You don't know where to find one. I think they're everywhere. Supermarkets, psh, check, check, you know. So um, if there's a Walmart near you, as much as Walmart is annoying, they have them. So um, Laura meant to say love everyone. Yes. As Zappa would say, I love the police as they kick the shit out of me on the street. Um, do I love everyone? I struggle with that. Do I love Ted Nugent? I struggle. Do I love Ted Cruz? Can I? It, the verdict's out on that stuff. Uh, pronounced like Celine. So Celine. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Celine, um, for saying that. And sorry, I garbled it. Um, uh, oh, that's an awesome moment, Laura, that you just realized Ryan and Sherry's cousin. Yes, yes. Um, it, it, it's pretty special, isn't it? I know she's smiling somewhere about that. Um, <laughs> Great moment then to find that out. Well, well. In return, uh, Ryan, Laura, uh, Laura is one of Sherry's most dear friends on this planet. I, I can't even emphasize. She's a si she's her sister, and Laura um, has uh, made many meals for us. Many holiday cakes we've each ordered for the other person. Laura has. Laura was there every day that she could. She has her own family. Uh, but every day that she could be in the hospital, she was there. And um, and if she couldn't be there, she would check in. So um, I'm glad that you you all um, met each other. Um, okay, backing up. Some great comments here. Um, Venmo, thank you. I will do that. Uh, Celine uh, is saying, oh, thank you, Laura. Right, curious about and planning to become a vegetarian. Yes, yeah, Celine, be in touch with Laura. Master Chef has been a cook in close to 10 of the great vegetarian and macrobiotic and vegan restaurants in New York City because she's lived around there m most of her life. But back to the late 70s, early 80s, um, uh, early 80s, right? You're not that old, Lord. But, but in the early 80s, um, being a caterer, a chef, a cook, a head chef in – some of the historic restaurants, uh, Celine. So good person to be in touch with and meet uh, online for hints and recipes and ideas and, you know, um, raising, you know, healthy boys uh, or, or any type of kid to um, to eat um, very healthy and, and in an exciting way, you know, not boring. Um, okay, continuing on. Great comments. Thank you all for being here. Uh, Bassam, what's up? You want me to address critical race theory? Yeah, I know, right? And this asshole, city council, and I pressed because he had two medical degrees. Okay, I'd love, please put that link here. So the way you're saying it, is this like a black conservative saying, I've not been oppressed? You know, I, I love those folks. I, I, I do. And to Laura's thing of loving everyone, I do love them because – they've got a shared experience and I want to sit down and understand how they got all the way around to that other side. I'm watching a video right now called, um, 
I'll, I'll put a link right now. Black conservatives debate black liberals. And it's a really cool thing that Vice put up. I love this shit. I don't shy away from hearing the other side. And so send me that, put me that link, Bassam, because if there's somebody saying that that's why we shouldn't talk about race because he got two medical degrees, then I'm first going to bitch slap him. <laughs> but, but also going to, um, you know, I want to hear and, and find out, like, how the fuck you got there. That's my favorite meme lately, the one with Batman just <laughs> slapping Robin upside the face. Uh, that's awesome. Uh, Lynn has tonight pasta and peas, lentils tomorrow, black beans, rice, cilantro. Oh, that sounds good. Uh, frijoles negros, arroz con cilantro. Got to do that last one in Espanol. Una comida muy bonita y deliciosa. Frijoles negros, arroz y cilantro. Con salsa y cebolla. Muy buena. I love it. I haven't had black beans and rice in a while. Uh, Laura says, I haven't tried the impossible or the beyond. Yeah, that's true. You can make all your own stuff. Yep. <laughs> uh there's Lynn saying she had an organic garden. That's great. Rescue remedy, absolutely. Um, um, uh, Steve Hershey, if you're still here, I wanted to say, how are you, my friend? And I just was watching you for about 20 minutes. I watched your video, wonderful video, pretty recent one on um, – um, it was great, and I, I love. I just love learning something new every day. And as much as I know what you know, major scales, minor scales, various pentatonic scales, various hybrid scales, whole tone scales. I, I know a handful of scales. I'm not a Slaminsky, not even a toenail of Slaminsky scale knowledge. But yeah, I've, I've wrapped my head around some stuff. Um, seven modes. I teach modes. I teach. You know. Uh, um, basic theory ideas but but that was a cool and 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 very down-to-earth way that you took it uh and you you just kind of you emphasized hey folks here's a way i can teach you some stuff about moods slash modes without any names without any you know and and you just kind of approached it from that direction which i thought was awesome i also thought it was awesome and i will steal this and use it your metaphoric connection to cooking which is really a great way to think of the the idea of um, a conservatory trained or Berkeley trained or just you know uh, Suzuki method whatever there's a hundred different but but someone who's really got the book thing versus somebody who has never doesn't even know much more than the names of of the strings on their instrument or the name of this drum or that drum. And you raised a great point. There's brilliant chefs around the world who've never, ever opened a book teaching them how to do this or that. But then there's these Michelin-rated chefs who did go to school for two, three, five, seven years. And, and you you made a beautiful point that it you can arrive at an incredible place, you know, um, but, but that it is valuable to poke your head in on kind of the, the bookish stuff. So thank you. Um, backstage babes. Uh, <laughs> oh, was that probably talking about uh, Motley Crue and all that? Uh, Lynn says, sunlight and depression helps so much. And the ocean. Yes, I know. Um, I know. Thanks. Thanks for your comments. It, it sucks that I lost that. 78 to 81. There we go. <laughs> um, Selling, you're welcome. Celine, you're welcome for your recipe. Okay, great. Um, um, ba, 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 ba. I want to stay on top of the questions. But some, I'm going to come back to that. Um, oh, okay. Wow, Frankie did... Um, Chill. Basam, that, that's a t-shirt, man. I, I did hear someone say that once a couple months ago, and I thought, let's do a t-shirt. Black beans matter. Um, oh, that's awesome. Send me pictures if Ryan Walsh meets Laura Darty. That would 
make my heart sing. And Candy would just flip if she she hears that. We have to tell her that you all just met on um, um, on um, uh, the virtual world. Uh, Celine says, okay, great. Um, okay, Bassam, I'm going to address that next. I'm just really uh, s running through to see that I don't miss any of your comments. I'm trying to get better at that. Uh, okay. What is the question? So Laura says, okay, crossing the street with shaded characters. Were people on here trying to learn? And their friends, absolutely, no, you're right. And yes, people here, I want to be kind to them. I want to, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I hope I wasn't, um, I hope I wasn't um, insensitive or unclear there. People here that phew, are putting their time in to come here uh, is um, absolutely um, no judgment. Rather, um, uh a little bit of prodding, maybe, to get people to think. You know, I want to be prodded. I want people to say, hey, that you, you could be wrong about this. Ponder that, you know. And, and that happens all the time. Whether it's about recycling or it's about some food product or palm oil or something. Or I remember years ago, a friend of mine pointing out non-leather shoes, which I, I thought were a good idea. He pointed out, well, if they're plastic and synthetic and oil based and all that petroleum based then it's actually worse because the 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 chemical residues making these things and then they're going to sit in the landfill for eighty thousand years and that 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 and i i thought so so prodding each other is um you know kind of a, a good idea um all right um over to um Bassam, um, well, Bassam, put that link in here so I can comment more. But uh, you wanted me to comment on critical race theory, which I, I'll jump into that for just a second. Um, I've I love feedback, and and even though sometimes I'm maybe prickly about it, <laughs> I'm trying to work on that and trying to not react. Take a deep breath first. People that love you are simply you know, saying, hey, you know, um, I, this just an, just an idea. So, um, but one um, thing I'm going to strive more to do is make sure that this show has a connective tissue throughout it for, for vegetarianism and veganism and macrobiotics and raw foods and any of those things on the spectrum, um, starting with just quitting one day out of the week. So, I say that before I jump into just a little bit on critical race theory before I come back. Also, I got this fun shirt yesterday. We have a really awesome situation here in Asheville where some gentlemen who own, um, I don't know if it's the first, but it is a black-owned coffee shop here in Asheville called Grind. And they've got they did the Grind Fest this weekend. And unfortunately, I was really busy. We were really busy and only made the very tail end yesterday. Literally, they we had just missed like the last performance and they were breaking it down. And, but people were hanging out and there was a food truck and, you know, um, great, just great to see folks out. Great to see, you know, more diversity than you usually see in downtown touristy Asheville. Really beautiful. And, and to support a black-owned coffee shop and you know, uh, really good coffee, by the way. And, um, but they had this cool thing where the owners have started Black Wall Street. Now, notice it says still lives. And notice it says 1921. Referring, as, let me get a sip of water, as many of you know, to um, Tulsa, Oklahoma, right? And, um, Oh, splashing water. And um, 1921, where we had this horrific racist attack on Black Wall Street, on the black neighborhoods, on the 40 square blocks, where it was a segregation time, so the whole area was black. And um, 
but it was um, people of all walks of life, right? K- kids were killed. Men, women, children, animals. Houses were burnt to the ground. People were shot trying to escape, trying to get in their cars and leave. Cars were burnt up. Bombs were dropped from airplanes on Tulsa, Oklahoma. May 31st, June 1st, 1921. So we just had a 100th year anniversary. And it really, wow, I was blown away to have the President of the United States talking about that shit, really for the first time extensively, right? Really some progress. And then for uh, Congress to make Juneteenth a holiday, which I know some people are off today already, so it's a beautiful thing. So that's what this means. Black Black Wall Street still lives. The idea that we can... um, People of all races can support uh, um, black-owned businesses, black-owned education ventures, and uh, um, you know um, programs of all types, artistic programs, cultural programs, education programs. Without any snark, can we just not have someone say, "Well, what about White Wall Street? How come? How come there's no White Wall Street? If I said that, I'd be a racist." Wow, Jesus fucking Christ. I actually, I'm cutting them out of my life, but I actually know people who would say nonsense like that. You know, well, black entertainment television, how come there's no white entertainment television? Wow. What what are you talking about? So without that kind of stuff and just understanding that, um, yeah, this is catch-up time. This is undoing 400 years. Of, of, of shit. So to your point, Bassam, yeah, critical race theory, which may have been less clumsily named, perhaps, uh, is an important thing. Having grade schools and high schools and, and then colleges, which is a little different, but in public schools, teaching children the actual verified fact-based history of this country has to be done. It's just unbelievable that there's a debate about this. It's unbelievable that triggered white people are calling that racist. I didn't say all white people. That's that's what's funny. I actually know people that that's what they heard. No, I'm saying the triggered ones, which is a subset of the total population of white people, but the triggered subset who hears talk of very disturbing descriptions of what happened to enslaved people, the brutality that goes beyond actually the type of slavery that existed all throughout Africa and India and Europe and South America and, and the Aztecs and the Mayans, the ancient Romans. The slavery is a thing that humans have done, right? The first thing to accept as an American is it was astoundingly brutal and taken to a new extreme. Did you all know that? Do you think of American slavery as actually ultra slavery? Because it was. Because I've studied this a lot. I'm not an expert, but I've studied slavery for most of my life. 40 some years at least. 45 years. And I've been fascinated to read that in many types of slavery, whether you go back to the ancient Greeks, ancient Romans, all different types of slavery in the Muslim world and in, in, in Asiatic world and Aztec Mayan world and many others we can list. One of the first things was you could often work your way or buy your way out of that slavery. That was very common. Uh, also, you usually were enslaved collectively, your whole family, your tribe, your village your whole group of people. And you usually, in those cases, were, you were the slaves of the conquering, you know, folk, but you could sing your songs and pray to whatever God you had and tell your cultural stories and all be in in this group. And under, I'm not saying it was a, uh, a party, but under pain of death, uh, you were still a slave, but you had those other pieces. What you have to understand about American slavery is systematically they realized that, oh, wait a minute, you know, we, we, we just got 100 Africans off this boat and 20 of them speak this language, six of them speak this language, 17 of them seem to speak a different language, and we know 
that they came from all these parts of, of the, the continent, that's the first thing. They purposely made sure communication was broken down, that music was not performed, religion was crushed out, uh, uh, all these cultural things. Tongues were cut out if you were singing this jungle music. So there's a whole subtext of complete, total spiritual and personhood destruction. It's very special how American slavery unfolded. And if this triggers you, you need to read more about it. That's all. And we're done coddling you. There were, you know, American slavery was exceptional. It was done. It was, you know, I'm serious here. They, it got taken to another level. And so the damage was at another level. And the straight line from 1865 and the whole idea of Juneteenth and the whole idea of slaves who didn't even know they were free, then the whole idea of the 13th Amendment, which extended this, right? Uh, some would argue to the present day because if the 13th Amendment, if you haven't read it, go read it, basically says slavery is over unless it's an imprisoned person then you can and so even today as we speak there's people in prisons making license plates or candles or whatever so you can make some arguments there but certainly right after abolishment in 1865 texas texas ran the clock on that the 13th amendment texas made up any law they could to lock up black people and then keep them slaves and, and put them right back on the field. You know, well, he was spitting. So, you know. So that's my thing on critical race theory. I'll, raise, I'll, raise, I'll, I'll move on now and I'll, I'll just say that, yeah, we need to be talking about it. And um, it's fucking crazy that people like Ted Cruz, did you hear what he said? Ted Cruz just said that critical race theory is exactly like the KKK. Right, Ted. That dude needs to be arrested. and, and uh, So he's saying that discussing the stuff I just did, he basically is saying, I, I, I'm just like the KKK. Because I, I did. I just bullet pointed just the very beginning of critical race theory. I didn't even get to Jim Crow and redlining and segregation and, you know, the 50s, 60s, and, you know, um, crack cocaine and the three big crime bills, third one of which drafted by our current president. I didn't even touch any of that stuff. But according to Ted Cruz, I'm just like the KKK because it's the same thing. Wow, dude. Wow. So talking about racism is exactly like a racist terrorist gang that over its history has killed, tortured, imprisoned, lynched, murdered, harassed human beings. Wow. You're a sick fuck, Ted Cruz. You really are. It's just amazing. What's sicker is many voters support the guy. So anyway, all right, moving on from that, I will look at this link later, Bassam. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm going to get back to some animal stuff now. It's more permissions is triggered. Yes, you're right. It's a deliberate muddling into a narrative. It connects... C oh, I didn't think of it. CRT is the initials. That's very good. Uh, it's like a TV screen uh, to a white set of issues. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for that post, Frank Bellina, my brother. And uh, always good to see you here. Um, okay, Bassam, that's awesome. Um, all right. I'm going to see if there's any other questions, and then I'm going to jump to some topics here. Well, we've been doing topics, but so Kevin says federal federal holiday is a good idea, but it slightly bothers you. At least we're celebrating the freedom aspect that teaches proper history, but the devastation portion is what shouldn't be promoted, but we taking up concepts like freedom. Well, yeah, I, I'm trying to parse that sentence and, and see if I feel that that is being promoted. It teaches proper history, the devastation portion. The devastation portion. So, well, you we, you can expand that. Uh, do you feel that the the devastation portion is being promoted? Because that's that's a tricky one. I want Americans to deeply soak in the reality of understanding that history, just as I do 
trying to soak up the Spanish-American War and what really happened, trying to soak up the Holocaust and what really happened, trying to soak up what happened to Japanese people, uh, uh, you know, um, being interned in, in the United States of America, try to, ha try to soak up what the Japanese people did to Korean and other Asian people uh, during their pogroms, basically. I want to soak it up. I want to hear everything about it. I want warts and all. I want, I want to hear it. I want to hear about the Boers in South Africa. I want to hear what Netherlands really fucking did to construct the racist apartheid machinery of South, South Africa. I don't want to shy away. Um, I could go on, obviously, for quite some annoying time. But I, 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 that's just my biochemistry. I want to hear these stories. This recent story of Canada and how, what, 200 native people, children, I think, all of them. Wow, that's a horrific story. Did you all read about this? Canada and the native people who were, were killed and, and, you know, forced into a horrible life. So with all of that, with that long list of shit, I want Americans on that list too. They've got to soak up and understand on a granular level, level, how we got to be the richest country on earth. And there's a number of reasons, of course, our great resources, the kind of untapped nature of a lot of things, the timing that right when America was colonized, we went into the industrial age and we went into, uh, soon after, you know, 100 years later, we went into um, you know, the age of railways and, and strip mining and, and understanding how to, do hydroelectrics and, and, and textiles. Everything exploded just in time for America, right? Uh, 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 the beginnings of mass agriculture. And we had infinite space and resources and stuff. So America really was right place, right time. But a big elephant in the room is a couple hundred years of free labor. So uh, on that level, I, um, I want... Uh, the suffering to be, um, sorry, sorry, uh, people are going to be uncomfortable about it. That's good. Discomfort takes us out of our comfort zone. And, and um, you know, so, um, so Bassam says, bring up racism cause racism. I know, right, bro? Bassam says he dealt with an asshole hanging with a friend who said that. I know, bro. I know. In psh, Marin County, please. The reality must be disclosed. We must take responsibility for our past, past transgressions. Right. And, and with a quote around the we, because it's not you, it's not me, it's not any white people that, that did things to people that look like me. Um, uh, it's not any of them because they're not alive. So that gets tricky, the responsibility part. I think the only responsibility is that you should be learning the history. I think that's a citizen duty. And so, um, you know, but otherwise, yeah, no, no harm, no foul. No one's mad at, at, at people just because you're white, which that's what they turn it into, these Ted Cruz people. Um, okay, coming back to that. Um, so two things I just want to touch on today. And, I, you know, I, I'm going to keep this. Actually, it's a short day today. Um, let me also... Thank you, Lord Darty, for reminding me. I'm going to put my Venmo here because I appreciate this. This is part of my employment <laughs> doing all these streams. I've also got my Patreon, which I forgot to remind folks. I lost a lot of work. So if you need to learn guitar, beginner or intermediate, you need to brush up your theory. I've had uh, a year, a year and a half of theory in college. If you want to brush up your scalar knowledge, your triadic composition knowledge, your just really basic harmonic knowledge uh, um how are how are chords constructed how are um you know what's the circle of fifth how do i construct various types of scales uh what are modes how do i work with them um if you want to you know get into some basic theory stuff um drop me a line or, or basic to intermediate guitar uh, you know uh it's it's now part of my life, part of my employment. So is doing this. This is always free, but hey, if you want to throw something in my tin cup, picture me just sitting on the street, babbling about 
mostly vegetarianism. <laughs> Some other stuff. But if you want to throw um, a couple quarters in that cup, I really deeply appreciate it. Um, so I'll put my Venmo now. And, um, and I also will put my Patreon because I – that's really where I spend a lot of time. What's Patreon? I don't talk about it enough, but it's got the word patron in it, going back to the 1800s with the most of the European composers. Um, and they had patrons where they had kings and queens and dukes and churches. And, you know, uh, I'm sure in the Islamic world, they had mosques who would give money to someone writing music, I guess. I don't know that for a fact, but it sounds good. It sounds like you, you would have had that. But but what are patrons? Um, the external financial source for artists, musicians, and other artists to create things and to have a life. Because they were providing a service. They are providing music for the village square or they were teaching at a convent or a school or something. So um, they were funded for a sensible reason. Today, there's something called Patreon, and um, here's my link now in the chat. And with Patreon, it's kind of a small, your own small world of supporters, fans, advocates, folks who just would like to see you continue. And, um, and I really appreciate it. I've got almost 30 people now in my little world um, of Patreon. And when I say little world, it's really a big world. It's, it's global. But what do I do? I do... Um, two or three performances a week, and I'm adding to that, of um, my solo acoustic music, my electronic music. I'm soon going to add some ambient stuff. I give workshops, technical workshops on, um, you know, all this kind of madness, you know, synthesizers and guitar effects. You can't see, but I'm in a studio. There's a guitar. And um, I... Uh, I do workshops a couple times a week on, not to get too esoteric, but this is a commercial. I, I do um, history of technology and studio techniques and what's MIDI and what's control voltage, what's a synthesizer, when were they invented, how do you use this type or that type. I talk about software on, on my classes. So I do all this stuff behind the, the, the curtain of Patreon. And it's really, I support a couple other people actually as patrons, um, which means I... I put $5 into their tin cup every month, you know, and in turn, you know, so I have a few people, we help each other out, but I have uh, on my link, I've got a $5 level, 10, 20. Some of them include guitar lesson. Some of them include consultation on natural foods. Again, tying this all in. Um, so check it out. Uh, uh, and, and if you want to help me out, that's great. Uh, my Venmo, thank you, Laura Darty, for reminding me. I'll put that right now. Um, Venmo. Bum, 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 bum. Let's see. How do I? Okay. Um, and it's at sign. What is that? A, yeah, it's a dash, not an underscore. Old school clicking keyboard <laughs> um okay i think i got it right because you don't want to misspell that and then andrew chumley is getting the money uh <laughs> so um uh okay there is um my venmo thank you um all right so Two things, I, I, you know, I don't have a long list, but I always try to have a couple markers I want to hit. So one thing I, I'm very increasingly concerned about is the animal reservoir idea. Have you all been following that? Animal reservoirs. I'm going to put, what, what I'm going to do is a little different. Instead of putting one or two articles in, I'm going to talk about one or two articles, but I'm going to put into the chat, the Google search return. Because if it's if it's something you're not familiar with, I want you all to really jot this down. This is a, this is huge. And, and if you've been up watching my show from time to time, you know I've brought it up before. You know I've talked about it. And I appreciate so many of you that, that have been here 
for quite some time. Um, the um, animal reservoir um, issue. You know, I've talked about the minks, right? And the minks that got infected and then they uh, very quick mutations of the virus, very fast infectation, uh, infection rate through uh, the mink population. It's how biology works. Different animals respond to different stuff, right? Cats are allergic to some food or it's poisonous to them that the, the giraffe could eat or whatever, right? Um, we know that. Biology is an incredible thing. And it turns out that the mink, the animal, that, that little beautiful animal that's sadly cultivated for fur, turns out, however the biology works, they get this COVID virus and it just burns through the population. Very fast infection. So some of y'all might remember when we talked about this and how the mink's population got hit very hard, first in Norway, Den Denmark, places like that. And they freaked out and they responded by, as we do, slaughtering millions of mink. So, but I talked about this a few times and we talked about animal reservoirs and I also touched on how dogs and cats ca can catch it a at a very low rate, it seems. When we're not testing, we don't actually know the rate, right? But um, you remember this, we were very early on reassured don't worry, you can't catch it from your dog or cat. Another dog might catch it, and we don't know what happens. So there's always been this little bit of a cloud. I urge you to read up on animal reservoirs because, um, and I'm going to go right to one of the articles on this. Um, so because, and sorry if this is a bummer, but this is going to happen again. Yeah, what we're going through. It's inevitable. This was inevitable. We were warned about this over and over. I mean, that's what's crazy. What we're going through is completely not a surprise. It, it, if you haven't internalized that sentence, you, you got to go read more then. There's nothing surprising about what we're going through. This was completely predictable. And, and packed into that is why the conspiracy theorists, because they can't wrap that around, they can't wrap their heads around that, yeah, Bill Gates sat down with countless epidemiologists, virologists, biologists, uh, statisticians in 20 different countries. That's what he did with his foundation, Bill and Melinda Gates and the experts they surround themselves with. That's exactly what they were talking about. They were talking to people who had experienced Zika, talking to people and gone through the whole battle to, to, to suppress Zika. They were talking to people who were dealing with viral outbreaks in India, in parts of Asia, in South America, all around the world, in Europe and the USA. We, we have uh, uh, different types of swine flu and, and avian flu that fortunately are little puffs that pop up and we suppress. We have mad cow disease, mad deer disease, and the Lone Star Tick disease here in the United States. Those are all zoonotic issues. Those are all these weird borderline. They're viral. They're, they're prion-based. If you don't know prions, look that up. P-R-I-O-N. The prion is a motherfucker. We still don't know what's up with the prion. They're these little kind of protein-coated organisms. Are they alive? Are they dead? Yeah, they're kind of alive because they have some type of motility and they infect and reproduce and stuff, but then you can't freeze them, you can't <laughs> smash them, you can't burn them, you can't boil them, you can't... What the fuck? They're hard to... I think fire is like the one thing. But um, but go look up prions because they're having a hell of a time in the Great Lakes area with deer having this prion-based mad deer problem. So the whole ball of wax says animals... And how humans treat them. Wake up, planet Earth. It's a one way. It doesn't matter what your opinion is on this. It just doesn't. I know that that bugs people, but it just doesn't matter. The facts are the facts. We are creating so much pressure on the kind of 
collective, not just the fa- flora, but the fauna uh, uh, biosphere of planet Earth. We're putting so much pressure. The list, I could go for six hours. You know the list. The plastics, the, um, the, 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 the hormone mimetic types of, of things that are in plastics. What that means is many types of plastics, as they break down, turn into these components that are hormone mimetic, hormone, uh, uh, um, hormone acting in these simple organisms. Go look this stuff up. The, the, the simplest aquatic life, whether it's these tiny organisms, like the stuff that krill eats, you know, like you go down to that level and uh, we're finding plastics, we're finding the, the excipients of petroleum-based modern life. We're, we're finding... Um, um, sexing issues on, on, on more complicated uh, organisms like frogs and other reptiles. We're, and then they do research and they say, holy shit, this whole species of frogs that's downstream from this plastics company, or the, they are r- reading these chemicals as biological hormones and it's freaking them the fuck out biologically. And they're, we are changing, we are genetically modifying not really, but let's, in, in kind of a way, right? This isn't the classical genetic modification, but in kind of a way it is because we are introducing hormone mimetic compounds to the animal kingdom and the plant kingdom, but, but, but where it's highly reactive and, and, and gets into this very fast pyramidic food chain kind of a thing is with animals. By the same token, we are expanding so quickly into... Uh, uh, jungles and forests and we are destroying habitats in the name of progress we gotta go 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 we gotta have a hundred thousand fucking brands of kombucha we gotta have a condo for everyone that, even if there's other housing that could be used i don't care i want this view cut the forest down and put 36 uh, uh, uh units here because we're humans and we deserve it we're paying a price for this we're destroying ecosystems all around the planet but what this pandemic should teach us is that the part of that that pushes animals into their stress zone, it might wipe us the fuck out. That's not extreme. Uh, you know, in a decade, this COVID thing could look like a picnic. I know there's someone going, oh, come on, Andre. Okay. Okay. Don't listen to me. Don't listen to me. Listen to the biologists, virologists, statisticians, people in uh, 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 health agencies in the countries that have been frontline here, right? Forget China for a minute. Very tricky. Communist China, the corruption, the non-clarity of sharing information. Got it. Problematic. Even though a lot of good vetted information does now leak out. It has to. Try as it might, it's not 1963 or 1973 or 1983. You can only suppress information so much in an information age where even with blocked websites and blocked internet, people can get things in and out of countries. So we do know a lot from China uh, um, uh, health agencies. But looking at the health agencies of your Senegals and your Zaires and your Ghanas and your, I'm forgetting there's a country right east of Nigeria that's had some serious problems recently with viral outbreaks. 15 other African countries. Specifically Africa, we should keep our eye on. Who, by the way, in Africa, the entire continent, they are under 1% vaccinated right now. So ponder that. Also ponder that you vaccine conspiracy people because that somehow screws up your, your, your narrative because, you know, but you'll change it because that's what you do. You'll, you'll just change it once Africa is partially vaccinated. The, the shit storm that's going on now, you can't blame on vaccines, but you will in, in 
five months. So so that's a whole fun area. But but just so we are tracking, one of the problems right now is that most of the planet is not vaccinated. Um, and I know someone, I just triggered a number of people. How dare you? You're a sheep. Sorry, I read about polio. So hate me. I actually read about the 10,000 year thread of smallpox and how since 1796, when we started inoculating against smallpox, it was a struggle for 200 and 220 years. And then we, we've got smallpox on the near zero. Sorry, I read about malaria. Hate me. I read about Zika. I read about things that we stop with vaccines. Because I can hold two thoughts at the same time. Uh, I can acknowledge the actual objective reality of what I just said, while also being highly critical of vaccines. And I am. I fucking hate vaccines, really. I hate it. I hate that we've had to come to this. But it's what's happened on our planet. We reached a critical mass of human population to where epidemiological issues uh, reach a certain math when you have X amount of people and, and you have cities and you have sources of food that are, you know, you have, you have reasons that unfortunately we've had to address things with, with chemical, uh, you know, compounds that we call vaccines. I hate it, but here we are. We're in a burning airplane. You do what you can. Um, animals. I'm talking about animals here, and I want to remind people that it's Meatless Monday, and it's it's what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm giving a huge kind of a – feels like a detour, but I, I really want people to understand how huge of an importance it is to start thinking about your relationship with animal agriculture. To start thinking about it. If you're not catching that animal yourself, slaughtering that animal yourself, it's in your backyard. And again, I give great respect to people who are facing up to the reality of slaughter. I really do. I really do. We, we have friends who are in Vermont, and they have ducks. They have chickens. They have a neighbor with goats and lambs. And they sometimes kill those ducks and chickens. But I have rafts of respect because that's not a factory. They're not drugging these animals. These animals are not in a concrete pen for two years. They're not riding up and down the highway in the middle of the fucking winter in these open... You've seen these... I want to cry when we pass those slave ships, I call them, enslaved ships of these trucks, right? You've all seen them rolling down the road. They're horrible. We look away, and then we pull into hard, hard, uh, Hardee's. Is that what it is? We we pull into to to um, Wendy's or McDonald's or Burger King and get a pulled pork sandwich. After going, oh, I hate that. I've seen people literally do that. Oh my God, I can't think about it. There's pigs in there. What are we gonna have for lunch? Oh my God, they have the the pulled pork barbecue. Oh my God, can you get me one? Yeah. D disconnect. So so I just want to try to have people connect this this 16 months we've all gone through with animals. I know a lot of y'all are fighting that and you're not used to that. Uh whether this version of SARS because it's just a version whether it originated in this lab because they were messing around with it and 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 doing uh, um um, conceptual testing to see if they can uh, um, optimize I its effects and things. But you do when you're studying pathogens. What are we going to do? What are we going to do except contain that, regulate it, have oversight, and lots of surveillance cameras? <laughs> Otherwise, what can you do? But But whether it came from that or the wet market a mile away, it doesn't really matter. Dozens of things have come out of the wet market. We know this for sure, right? But no one bothers to read. But if you Google and watch some documentaries or little clips about, there's a documentary that um, 60 Minutes Australia, you know, there's a 60 Minutes 
for Australia and for probably for Argentina and six other countries. But but if you watch the just Google the Australian sixty minutes did a, a thing, an expose on wet markets just about a year ago. It was a couple months into into the American experience of COVID. Because remember, the Chinese experience of COVID goes back to November, mid-November of, of 2019. Uh, but if you look at that, you'll see that wet markets are a fucking nightmare. And you've got outbreaks of intense versions of E. coli. Because again, E. coli isn't one thing. There's different you know, variations on that theme. Variants, a word we hear all the time now. So, uh, but the wet markets have coughed up E. coli outbreaks, salmonella outbreaks, uh, trichinosis outbreaks. Uh, uh, trichinosis, not outbreaks, but um, uh, um, high occurrences of uh, uh, um, other, all kinds of, go look this up. I get frustrated because it's like, folks, we're in the greatest time ever to take 20 minutes a day and just say, is there something besides TikTok or Facebook? I heard there is. Let me click on news. I know it's depressing and it's boring, but we just keep getting fucked by ignorance. So the wet markets clearly are a major problem. Forget how brutal they are and how it's mind blowing. It's not racist to talk about this. It's not anti-Asian. What are you talking about? What's anti-Asian is actually being anti-Asian, which is a fucking nightmare right now in the United States of America. Okay? that That's what's anti-Asian. Being anti-Asian is the right-wing GOP excusing of this guy for four years talking about uh, uh, the Wuhan flu and the Kung flu and on and on and on and on, reflecting in a massive spike in violence against Asian people. It's still ongoing. It's heartbreaking. But to talk about wet markets, because I talk about American animal nightmares just as much. The the pig slaughter factories and farms, the, the, the hog waste pools right here in my state of North Carolina, or South Carolina, in Ohio, in Indiana, in California, in Utah, in the Dakotas, in Wyoming. All these states, California, if I didn't say, have these giant pools of hog manure that they can't process. They don't know what to do with. So you keep making giant pools of it and saying, well, we'll figure it out someday, but we've got money to make. So I, I criticize American abusive animals just as much. So when we start talking about wet markets, don't be gaslit that this is anti-anyone. It's just pro-animal. That's it. So we know the wet markets have coughed up a lot of problems. And if you've shied away from what an actual wet market is, please go check it out. Again, the Australian 60 Minutes special is great, but there's umpteen ways you can go read about this. But in brief, they are markets, which on some level is a beautiful thing. I'm always talking about farm markets, right? I love it. And I'm sure I would go do a wet market, and if I entered on the right side, I'd be delighted. I'd be going, oh, my God, look, star anise. And here in China, this would be I'd, – I'd be saying as a vegetarian, oh, this is great. Those look like mustard greens. Let me – can I – Try a piece, you know. Oh, bok choy and leeks and these beautiful potatoes. What's this? Here's a, a woman selling fresh tofu. Oh my God, this is ah. Oh. Then I turn the corner and see stacked up some beavers or something or a fucking eagle that 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 they're gonna slaughter. And, and but the problem is there's a beaver and an eagle and eels on the bottom in a in a glass thing. And then over here they've got. A, 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 a pangolin or three of them in a fucking little cage that are dying and, and, and they're getting shit on by maybe some other mammal and then there's rodents because the whole massive place has lots of food scraps and everything and so the rodents are carrying things back and forth. Did rodents bring the virus a mile up the street from the lab? 
Entirely possible. It doesn't really matter, though. <laughs> it's like, here we are. It's like, it's like talking about the Big Bang. Really interesting. I love it. But we'll never really know. Um, animals, animals, animals. That's what I'm here to talk about. I'm here to just... Just ask you to think about it and just think, can you take one day a week? Can you urge your friends and family to just even have a conversation? <sighs> I don't have kids. It was Father's Day yesterday. I um I opted out. <laughs> we opted out a couple of times and it's the choices that were made. I, I, I so I don't have any actual biological kids. I have students that I have mentored and inspired and that I that I love that in their adulthood I run into them sometimes. Hey, Mr. Chumley, you you subbed in my class in you know 2009 oh hey what the, wow you work here you know i love it it's it's a beautiful thing i'm not a parent i'm not saying i understand parenting but i understand knowing that wow i've done a little bit for the future and wow this is awesome so i i'll go to my grave whether it's 30 years from now or 30 minutes from now i'm okay that i left something you know with with, with the next generation really overjoyed about that and and uh, even now as an artist, as a musician, the young people I have as students, as fellow musicians, as people who learn from me, wow, it, it's so, it, it, it gets me through. So, um, so, so I, I bring that up to say that while I'm not a parent, I worry on some level because I want <laughs> people that I know in the next generation to have fresh water, fresh air, a livable planet, all these things. Um, and it's it's amazing to see us um, squander so much. So on that note, um, that was a long introduction for this article of uh, where is it? Uh, <laughs> so many things on my okay. Here it is: the search for animals harboring coronavirus and why it matters. I'm going to put this link in the chat, but y'all can see it on the screen. This is merely eh, three and a half months ago. There's newer articles. There's older articles. But this one's talking about how scientists are looking at pets, livestock, and wildlife to see where, it, where COVID loves to hang out. Now, the one we talk about a lot for a year now is the bat various types of bats the horseshoe bat and a couple other types of bats. remember bats are one of the oldest species of mammals on earth it's i believe the oldest mammal species someone can check me on that i'll put an asterisk there i'm not sure if that's a fact but I, i'm relatively sure uh, that it's the oldest mammal species R regardless it's one of the oldest if i remember correctly somewhere in the order of of 75 million years or some fucking ridiculous number like sharks like all these other things i can look this up while we're here um if i remember correctly there's 1500 odd species of uh bats on earth bats are amazing they're remarkable they're ancient they have highly developed immune systems arguably the most powerful immune systems in, in a mammal you know um they're right up there. They're in the Olympic level of immune systems. So are sharks. Remember the whole flap of sharks don't get cancer. So let's kill them all, take their bones, and, and eat the cartilage. Wow, we are so fucked up, man. Wow. That's why there's a little percentage of me that's team COVID. Yeah. Yeah. Because if, if COVID's here to get rid of the parasite that would... Find out sharks don't get cancer, so let's kill them and eat them. I, I'm I'm kind of team COVID for a minute there. I know someone's now going to say Andre hates humans. No, it's not what I said. No one has a sense of humor anymore. 
anyway, look at this article when you can. Uh, really good reading. And again, I don't fuck around. This isn't Joey's blog from Long Island. I try to read on the pop level, Time, Newsweek, but then the New York Times, MIT, uh, uh, um, you know, um, The Guardian, The Independent, uh, uh, you know, uh, serious newspapers, serious uh, um, science sources, CDC, World Health Organization, with a critical eye, because they get politicized. But to see what science is happening, I look at what's coming out of Australia. I have a friend that lives in Australia. We trade articles all the time. And uh, I, 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 what, what's their health department doing? Americans should be reading what the Australian health department is doing. Why? Because they've done fucking well during this. That's why. That's just un-American, though, to look around and say, hey, they're doing this better, whether it's public art or comprehensive health care or the train system. Or 14 years of public education. We're loath to just look around and say, hey, they're doing it way better than us. We're humble enough to look that up and, and maybe learn some shit. Nope, it's not what we do. Anyway, uh, those of you who want to do that or have always done that, here's another thing you can study. Um, really great article. And I've read a few. And I've, uh, over the over the 14 over the 14 uh, months. And I've also want to recommend Dr. Michael Osterholm. Okay. That guy. What a genius. I, I watched him on J Joe Rogan. And um, uh, he's just, just has a great way of um, presenting this thorny scientific info. I'll put his, wiki on the links so dr michael osterholm is a um boy you know uh well he's right now on on the covid19 advisory board okay of of the current administration so he's on the covid19 advisory board so you can imagine that's the team sitting around at a table f looking at this stuff giving advice figuring out these things talking to people in other countries because this is a global problem um but this guy is um he's got a ba in biology and political science actually he's got an ms and a phd in environmental health and he's got an mph masters of public health in epidemiology um this is all from university of minnesota and luther college he's been at the minnesota department of health as an epidemiologist and the chief of acute disease epidemiology for 15 years he's an expert in infectious disease epidemiology foodborne disease outbreaks i've seen him on tv talking about salmonella e coli different things toxic shock syndrome and tampons he's, he's an expert on hepatitis b and hiv and healthcare workers on and on and on the guy has spent most of his life talking about infectivity and things and biosecurity and 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 public health responses I first encountered him, Robin and I first encountered him, watching him on the Joe Rogan experience. Stumbled across this amazing interview right at the beginning of the pandemic. I can't think of anything that was more valuable. Because in March 2020, uh, before the famous March 13th, it was very early. I, I'm going to estimate we watched this around March... 9th, 10th, 11th. It was right before that psychopath had the White House lawn meeting. Remember that? With the with his superheroes that were going to save the world, a.k.a. Walmart, Walgreens, uh, Roach Diagnostic, uh, CVS, and, and one more I'm forgetting. Remember that? They were going to save the world. He had the CEOs of these companies on the White House lawn. March 13th, 2020. <clears throat> he told us, with lightning speed, these companies are going to fix this all. Their parking lots are going to be filled with vaccination programs just in a couple of weeks. They're going to be doing testing. 
free. Just everything's awesome. We're writing them billions of dollars, but they're going to come back, America, and we're going to solve this with the private industry. As you all know how that movie ended, none of that shit happened. Uh, I tracked it. I brought it up on this show countless times because it has to do with animals and this outbreak. And uh, at the very most, Walgreens did some, some commendable work for healthcare workers. Remember? We checked it over and over. We were waiting for this big program supposed to happen. Yeah, they just did some stuff for in a handful of states offering free testing for healthcare workers, which hey, we salute that, but it's not what we were told. Um but anyway, my point is that even before that day, we saw this interview with this guy, Dr. Michael Osterholm. I will put his uh, his link right there. Brilliant guy. He's got some amazing stuff to tell, not just about COVID, but about mad cow, mad deer. Uh, as I said earlier, the um, I always forget the name of this. The Lone Star Tick, right? Which is another weird. Not drinking enough water. <sighs> yeah, big monologue day today, folks. Thank you for hanging in there. Who wants to hear me prattle on? You people are crazy. Let's get back to some of your comments. Um, what does this have to do with vegetarianism? I know someone's probably saying that. Um, kind of everything. Because our approach to animal agriculture is bringing us down. You start reading these articles and you start seeing that on a global level, scientists are incredibly nervous about what's coming next. Because these millions of species... And you start cutting down forests, cutting down jungles, encroaching into forests. We're doing it in the Great Lakes area and in California and in, in these fast developing areas. Um, where we live, it's in the forest. It's in, a, it's in a temperate rainforest. We have an interesting problem here in Asheville. They're not expanding too much. It's beautiful. Forests and deep, deep protected, actually. We're very lucky. Um, it all goes back um, to a man named George Massa, a Japanese man who lived here in the Appalachian area uh, about 110 years ago, in 1910, 13, somewhere around there. Japanese man came here from Japan and, and came to New Orleans for a while and then came to this area of North Carolina. Man, I'd love to time travel. Imagine the stories he tells. You know, talk about the racism, the anti-Asian things that were happening at that point, predominantly anti-Chinese, but certainly what a brave man. But he came here to this area and he's the man who mapped a lot of the Appalachian uh, um, uh, um, mountains and, and trails and rivers and streams. Of course, the Cherokee people were here before that. Of course, they had their own navigation of where we were. Of course, they had names for things and everything. Of course. But the next wave of that what was started with this guy and i bring him up because the direct line to our problem is that he is the guy who um created some real energy around how beautiful this area is how special it is we're 2000 to 3000 feet above sea level incredible ecosystem and and he was able to start putting it on the map, literally, and start making it uh, known to those in Washington. And the president at the time, I forget who it was, if it was, um, it wasn't Roosevelt, uh, was it Coolidge? I can't remember. Um, not germane to the story, but um, might have been Teddy, might have been Teddy Roosevelt. Whoever the president was, was the one who made this whole area 
protected national park, all that stuff. So we're lucky that we're not slicing down forest as fast as happened in other in other parts of America or around the world. And how this fits into a meatless Monday thing, I, I'm going to keep bringing it back, is that as we encroach into natural habitats of animals, there's a breakdown that happens on a bunch of levels at once. These animals now encounter other animals that they never would, including the human animal. These animals now have habitats that are lost, ecosystems that are gone away, uh, 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 their whole food chain gets thrown off. Some of them start encroaching on humans. Humans start getting bitten by these new bats that we've never seen. These humans start being exposed to the feces of these birds that we've never really caught avian flu from. Uh, uh, different types of rodents are now integrated into... This is happening. I, this isn't crazy talk. Look this shit up. This is happening in, in many countries in Africa, many parts of the USA. This guy, Dr. Osterham, talks about it happening with uh, the Great Lakes area. But, but this is how we're creating the next pandemic to pull it all together. The animal reservoirs, the extreme overdevelopment, and our rapacious relationship with breeding, poisoning, torturing, entrapping, transporting in horrible conditions, and ultimately slaughtering animals. At the industrial level, I, I hate that I have to keep saying it, it's amazing how triggered people are. I'm not talking about you, the person who, uh, 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 you know, eats lamb from the Amish guy that you go get and, and, and you saw the lamb the, the week before. I'm not talking about you. Stop it. I'm talking about Tyson and, and Archie Daniels Midland and uh, you know, talking about, uh, um, I can't even remember some of these corporations, talking about the Cargill and these giant, you know, city-sized factories that are, you know, just machines. You got to watch some of these videos. You'll cry to watch thousands of cattle and they're all being directed by robots and forcible bars and machines to walk down a line and they are very aware because they can smell and see and hear what's happening 10, out, uh, uh, 10 cows ahead of them on the line. That's one of the most heartbreaking things you'll ever see. But you click away. The Juicy Burger, it's my right. Wow, man, that shit is so fucked up. But when you see these slaughter uh, machines, factories, and you watch, and, and it, it's heartbreaking. Uh, it, it depresses me to my core to think about a beautiful cow when it gets to the front of the line and then suddenly a metal bolt <laughs> goes into its head. <laughs> well, it doesn't scream, but um, it, it makes a guttural noise. But the cow behind it, that's the money shot. That fucking cow is in terror because they know what's happening and they're hearing it and they're smelling the blood. And the cow behind that is in fucking terror. And the cow behind that is just so we can have Two ninety nine beef. Wow. <sighs> All right. Um, plus, it's causing <laughs> pandemics. Oh, that's great. So, um, Todd Reynolds, how are you, my brother? Um, good to see you. And let's uh, let's talk later. Um, let me check my text because if Todd Reynolds would ever answer my texts. It's too busy for me. But if Todd would ever <laughs> I'm kidding, bro. As you know. Uh if I um if if you can be part of this presentation this week, I will announce it. But um Okay. Uh Todd, that's terrible to hear. The manatees, huh? There's something on NPR. Damn it, man. I know. Everywhere we look. Humans, overdevelopment, 
encroachment on wildlife. <sighs> Thanks, Todd. If you remember, and you have a link here, but I'll try to remember, I have an NPR app on my phone because I love NPR. But... Um, all right, back to some of your questions. Laura Darty, thanks for hanging around. Animals, yes, infested by disease. Todd Reynolds, thank you, bro. I'm, I'm glad you are um, happy to hear my voice. I need to hear your voice soon. Let's do a Zoom cocktail and catch up on some shit. It's been a while, and there's been a lot of shit. <laughs> and a lot of good things, too. Yin yang. They closed the lamb slaughterhouse in Shrewsbury. Wow. Well, that's good. I, I you know hope for the right reasons earthing ed in instagram okay uh sharon lynn baker says i'm extremely late that's okay i was extremely late <laughs> getting on today i started at 3 12 which was eh. what are you gonna do cpt um th uh that's right i'm a dad of a dog uh jam um bats are yeah bats are a very large um mammal species Laura, wow, toxic shock syndrome. Fuck. Yeah, another area of the industry just said, fuck off. <laughs> Mad Cowboy, right? Howard Lyman, right? I don't know who Eric Marcus is. Please tell me. Oh, he's got a book, Veganism, New Ethics of Eating. Good. That's awesome. Um, uh, fast Bats. Yeah, that's great. Uh, oh, yum. Steamed local broccoli and cauliflower, shredded and tossed in kale. Oh, that's good. Kale pesto made with tahini, apple cider vinegar, garlic, nutritional yeast, and hot sauce. Psh. A normal thrown-together meal at <laughs> Lord Darty's house. That sounds exquisite. That sounds great. Let's see. What did I have for lunch? I had two or three raviolis left over from last night. Delicious little raviolis that we got. We were lazy. We didn't make it from scratch. But they were wonderful. Um, I forget the company, but, you know, raviolis with, like, squash and um, some sort of vegan pesto inside. Uh, really nice. But with some kale that I steamed that Robin repurposed with some tahini. Delicious kale and tahini for the win. What else was in there? Um, some tofu that, that she did up. Just simple. Psh. Tofu is a staple, you know, tempeh is more of a staple, but tofu, you know, half as much. Um, but, uh, yeah, pretty simple lunch. Um, and eating a lot of fruit, eating a lot of peaches, and they're in season, and cherries, and had some pineapple, which one of my concessions to getting something that's not from around here. But um, thanks for sharing your lunch. What else did you all have? Anyone else? Monsanto, yeah, fucking nightmare. Laura says, dinner took 10 minutes. Yeah, walking into your backyard to pick herbs is <laughs> the most. Uh, that's great. Food from the garden, Celine says, yeah. Um, tur turmeric and, oh, nice, turmeric and curry. Uh, Howard Lyman, right. Um, all right. Um, okay, so I'm going to get back to the other topic here, which is really fucked up. So brace yourself. Sorry. The shit's real. Um, other questions? Um, Sharon? Did, my gig. Um, I did not talk about my gig, and um, I'm going to um, – I'll say something briefly that it was fine. It was great. And I will be posting more about it. I recorded it, so I'm going to do some sort of uh, reduction of my two hours of audio to, to something cool. It was my first gig in 16 months, so it was a little nerve-wracking. I was unduly nervous. I had no reason to be. And that went away quickly, even before I went. And just the whole ritual of packing up and setting back up. I haven't done it in, in quite some time. Done it for decades, suddenly haven't done it for 16 months. Um, 
But actually, I was incredibly calm, and it went really great because I've been doing this. So I've, I have been practicing performing, really, and I've been streaming and performing and doing. So it, was, it went great on a certain level because I was super ready uh, for a lot of things. I also did it because I was in a room on my own with glass uh, glass windows on two sides, um, just me at a table with all my stuff, beautiful sound system that I brought, these little speakers that are amazing. So I was sitting in this incredible wash of sound, and from what I hear, all the audience, which was small, but it was a, over time, I don't know, maybe 30, 40 people coming in and out, you know, and maybe 15, 20 who were there the whole time. It was chill. It was at a meadery, you know, where they make mead uh, or sell mead. And um, uh, really wonderful. And the the sound system was incredible. An old friend from a club in Chicago designed it. So it sounded great, felt great. I was safe. Wasn't a regular gig with people coming up and bugging you and stuff. Um, we had masks going in and setting up. Uh, couldn't have been a better way to, to get back into the, the mix. Since it was Juneteenth, also, it felt great, and I did one lengthy piece that I repurposed speeches from Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Angela Davis, Gil Scott Heron, Jesse Jackson, uh, all kinds of fun. So that's my gig report. Thanks for asking. Great time playing again this Sunday, and I will put some audio up soon. Um, okay. Um, so my other item, we talk about Michael Osterholm and how much he can teach us about animals. Really incredible. Check out his Wikipedia. There's a great interview from Joe Rogan. There's some great appearances in the mainstream press. Uh, meet the press there's a real famous clip there where he he's psh, i love this guy because no sugar coating no bullshit his 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 credentials are established and and deep 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 experience but no matter what nutcase conspiracy theorists will say well uh i heard he owns stock in in or i heard for two years he worked for this company that that oh, man Conspiracy people are amazing. So, so they'll, they'll ignore 35-year career and then find that one month where he went and, and gave lectures at some organization that they deem at the heart of their ever-changing conspiracies. And the other 35, the other 34 years and 11 months at the window because this fits our narrative. Anyway, this is a tough guy for them to do that with because his experience is so deep and so um, lengthy, right? Um, and working in private industry and also HHS, CDC, locally in in Minnesota, in academia, teaching. You know, he's a very interesting person. Uh, and there's many that that we can, that we can that we can look at very very many um so check him out um check out also the um article i put on uh animal reservoirs please and i'm gonna put it in here again just for for good measure because i think it's so important google it yourself but if you just go to this link which is all uh, a Google link. I just put it up. Just just hit that and, and bookmark it and maybe use it. Just a suggestion. You don't have to do this. You can just do your own research. But uh, this is just the Google results of the words animal reservoir COVID. I mean, I'm, I'm just saving you, you know, nine seconds there. But I want you to just, I just want to call attention that there's a lot of science Right now, there's a, a real search for what's next. What, what animals, what's our early warning system, you know, on this? Are we, you know, the good news, there's always good news. The good news is most countries with the resources are 
doubling down now on early warning systems, looking at animal populations, looking at rural areas where a lot of these probably, I'd say the majority that I've read about, I don't know if it's um, across the board, but I think it's safe to say the majority of these SARS, MERS, Zika, SARS-2 now, uh, uh, um, are rural in nature at first, right? They, they tend to be, even uh, 100 years ago, which was a swine flu, right? The 1918 one that lasted for three years and change, killed anywhere from 50 to 70 million people on Earth. We just shrug at that. It's amazing. But um, and that's a big number considering the world population in, in 1920, right? Uh but that was rural, right? That was that's been traced as close as they can to um I forget which Midwest state, but either Kansas or Arkansas or Idaho or one of these places where there's um pigs, hogs on a farm and, and um this 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 jump to the human species of this viral um entity and then, unfortunately, there was army barracks, not far in the same state, I guess. And, 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 and people in the army got it. And they just thought it was a bad cold and the flu. And they got on ships to go to World War I. You know, uh, and we know this. I mean, this is, this is 100 years ago. This is blink of an eye, really. We, we, we knew a lot about biology at that point. We knew a lot about epidemiology. We understood, quote unquote, the germ theory. We had microscopic knowledge. We had, geez, 1920, you already had, um, you, you had 130 years of vaccine science by, by 1920, right? Uh, you had vaccine proof for you, conspiracy people, and, and you people uh, screaming about freedom. In the late 1800s, the U.S. government demanded proof of vaccine to enter the U.S. And so federal agents would go on trains coming in from Canada and check everyone on board for vaccine proof. Now, at that point, you looked at their arms because they had a pretty badass scar because of the way they would do vaccines. But, um, you you know, this this whole notion... This Bill Gates and Fauci and, oh, my God, how do you people come up with this bullshit? I love it because I love comedy and I love um... the funny part is that there have been conspiracies. There have been Tuskegee experiments. There have been lies from the CIA, from HHS, from our government. That's what makes it tricky, right? Right? Our, our, our officials that we have entrusted and given power for various things, they have lied to us. They have poisoned us. They, there's all kinds of... That's what makes it slippery, that the temptation to just now believe that... Okay, so everything's a conspiracy. No. You've got to... You know. Anyway, please read this on the animal reservoirs. Please, you know has everything to do with with what I'm what I'm always talking about to to eat a little bit more uh lower on the food chain. So I'm going to share one more link and one more doctor with y'all and then I'm out of here. But um yeah, it it's um please so hit me with your last couple questions. I'm going to stay on maybe another 10 minutes. Um cuz this is an ongoing story. So hit me with any questions. Uh, I see 16 people here. Wow, that that means a lot. Uh, and I know I haven't talked all about food today, and my apologies if you tuned in hoping to hear about a vegan Waldorf salad or how do I do a, a Thai baked tofu curry. I know. Sometimes we do talk about food. I apologize if you were expecting a chef today or vegan donuts in Seattle. I, I know. there's we We can hit a lot of those things. I just felt like... Actually, you know what really tipped it for me? And it ties in to what I'm about to close with, 
which is the Delta variant, right? All of this has to do with animals. All of this has to do with the unbelievably large and destructive animal slaughter industry and the encroachment into nature where these animals live. But what really was kind of amazing to me, and I'm not easily rattled at all, but to see the President of the United States, Joe Biden, who actually is the president who won the election, to see him with deep concern in his face and his voice, I think it was Thursday or Friday, talk about the Delta variant in really grave terms and really talk about how the numbers are moving fast on this. It's very analogous to some other times when we've been like, whoa, the, in three days, those numbers changed. We're starting to be there. I was very sobered by Boris Johnson, by people, the leadership in my beloved England. I love England. Been there many times. Love it. Would move there tomorrow if you paid for it. For better or worse, I was born a British subject. I was born in British Guyana. It sucks. Colonialism is horrible. <laughs> the most racist, slave-based, murderous bullshit the British came up with. But there you have it. I was born there. Um, so I love Britain. And to s with, I have relatives there, as you would imagine, and many friends. And I'm dismayed because they were working on the, their opening date. And Boris Johnson just came on and said, uh, yes, um, we're quite sorry to announce we'll be pushing the date back. This Delta variant is moving far too quickly. Um, that was more of a Greg Lake than a Boris Johnson. But uh, the point is, we snoozed. That's right on the fucking headline news. That's, that's kind of the other top-level first-world ally we have. We don't care. We got to get back to the uh, to the concerts and the Disney worlds and the movie theaters and the packed beaches and the we don't care. We're tired of it. So let's move on. So if we were looking at Delta on a global scale in Australia, which is where I'm going to end my story, uh in Brazil, in India, where it, it, it used to be called kind of the India variant, it has changed again. They're calling it the Delta. Please read about this because the infective rate has gone up a massive amount with this new variant. And again, my punchline, if you don't believe me, just go look up Joe Biden on Friday or uh, Thursday where I was really amazed how grave he sounded about it. And he said... You states with a lot of unvaccinated people, we're seeing some really concerning numbers. And um, he actually said uh, you, there, there could be increased death about this. You could die or, as a result to this, which is really, you know, I'm just saying you, 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 you juxtapose that with how we're acting, which is, yay! A switch was flipped, and everything's fine. Okay. Well, the President of the United States, <laughs> as much as half his job is to calm us down, all these things, he's not saying that, but okay. Let's, let's go to this concert with 900 unmasked people who's infective and immunity and antibody and vaccine status is unknown. Sure, sounds good to me. So on that note, I will close with some reading material here. This is... Mm -mm -mm. So I'm going to start with this doctor, another doctor that I follow on Twitter. There's a number of them, people around the world. And you know what? All of y'all who send me the conspiracy stuff, I watch it. I watch it. I watch it all. I've watched it for 14 months. The bummer is it falls apart under scrutiny. I'd love it to be a little more interesting because then you had – but that's what sucks. But I do watch it. So please send me send me that stuff. Um, uh, 
Dr. Eric Feigelding. You might have seen him on TV. He's an American public health scientist. He's a senior fellow at the Federation of American Scientists. And I know someone's going to say, oh, it doesn't matter, because I saw this video once where, okay, I don't know what I can say. I just don't know what I can say. Education matters. I mean, we're just, we're funny, you know, because if if someone, if Herbie Hancock came in and gave a jazz workshop and he's talking about, you know, uh, higher order chords and how to, how to improvise, you know, in the Locrian mode and, you know, w- you know, hey, you know, 13th chords, let's do a workshop and, and let's, uh, let's break down Bye Bye Blackbird and, and talk about the different ways we can transpose it and talk about, um, you know, uh, when I was in the Miles Davis band and we, we used to recontextualize the, the Mingus book on this song. And, and, but, but, you know, he would reharmonize the horn section and do this whole thing. If Herbie Hancock gave that whole lecture, but then with his education and his expertise and his, what are we, pushing 60-plus years of, you know, being at the top of that game. But then some guy in the back of the lecture is going, I don't buy it. What do you mean? I, I heard from this guy. I think he plays banjo uh, or guitar or something on the weekends. And he said that uh, tuning to 441 aligns with your chakras. And, and, and it, the, 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 this is this guy. I mean, come on. You'd say, you're fucking crazy. I just listened to an expert in a series with... 25 experts and you're saying some other not anyway uh, clumsy analogy i know but hopefully you know anyway eric feigelting uh, i have it on the screen now he's a you know senior fellow at the federation of american scientists ex-faculty and researcher at harvard medical school and at the harvard th chan school of public health uh on and on and on i'm not going to read his whole Thing, but we first started hearing about him 16 months ago, 17 months ago, in late January 2020. Because I remember he was one of the ones saying, wake the fuck up. Now, he happens to be a Chinese birth person. He's born in Shanghai, China, right? He's obviously, though, uh, he's an American and he's grown up here, been, been to school here for many years. Uh, but being someone from China, I would imagine he was paying a bit more attention to this in mid-November when it started breaking. And so two months go by. It's January 2020. The fucking racist psychopath clown is saying there's nothing and blah, 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 blah. It's never coming here. While that's going on in January 2020, by the way, having closed the White House office of epidemic preparedness or whatever it's called the actual fire station that we installed in the white house for fires let me simplify it for the nut cases if you meet a nut case maybe you simplify it for them it's like a fire station which you need a fire department because you have fires is that can you can you all swallow that one That a fire department's a pretty good idea once you've got enough homes in an area that, that to put out the fires. Okay, so imagine if someone came along, your new mayor, let's say, in your town of 100,000 people where you may have a, a number of fire stations. And let's say your new mayor said, nah, who needs a fire station? I don't like fire stations. The last mayor funded the big fire station. I don't like him. Let's get rid of the main fire station that, that's in my mayor office. What do you, sir, what, yeah, the main fire station that communicates with the other ones when there's a fucking fire. I'm closing it. Wow, sir, what, that's, well, excuse me, sir, but it's batshit crazy to do that because we may have fires, and so we need to 
No, shut it down. Well, that's what he did, okay, for the Office of Epidemiology that was in the White House. Having said that, again, back to Dr. Eric Feigl Ding. He was one of the people, I remember hearing about this. Uh, I barely knew his name then, but in, in January 2020, because he's an expert, they had him on, you know, different, you'd hear his, his quotes on NPR and different places. And he was saying, mayday, 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 fire. We've got to act. You know, he was, and so was, uh, all right, uh, I remember her name, um, uh, Dr. Nancy Messonnier. Remember her? Look her up. Look her up. She was fighting for you. She, I forget her title, but she was, I think, in the CDC. And when uh, um, Psychopath came back from his India trip, remember that? That was a doozy. That's when he went to India and folded his arms and never touched a piece of food. Remember that? That's so psychotic. They made state dinners for this guy, and he turned his nose up at everything. And he just, I'm not eating that. It smells funny. Why'd you even go? It's just, wow. You're just partisan, Andre. No, he's a psychopath. And, 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 but anyway, so he comes back from India. Alarms are going off everywhere. Italy's in trouble. South Korea, Hong Kong, Singapore. Australia's just starting to see issues because they had that big cruise ship. This jackass is saying it's never going to happen here. Blah, blah, blah. Nancy Messonnier, she either quit or was fired, but she was begging him. She was one of the first people, right when he got off the plane, begging, sir, we have to look. This is really bad. And since we have open borders and flights coming in from all of these places and we're just starting to get some preliminary reports, sir, 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 can you? Sir, I'm I'm speaking to you. I, I so he's gone. He he doesn't care about. Okay, he, did he really? He's gone. Yeah. So so Eric Feigelding and Nancy Messonnier. Hey, you tried. We thank you. So so Doctor uh, Feigelding. Uh, I love his Twitter. He's funny. He's informative. He's on the case. And um, I'm going to leave you with, because this is going to be a two-parter. I'm going to jump off of here. And I'm going to leave you with his Twitter thread from just, uh, when was this? Two days ago? June 20th. What the hell day is it? I don't know. Who even knows? What month is this? <laughs> is it the 21st? It must be the 21st. Um, so this is yesterday, okay. Um, you got to watch this. Uh, uh, I, I'd like you to. I hope you do. You don't have to do anything. But um, this is a report. It starts with Australia, who we should be listening to every day because they've brought this down to – zero in many areas, certainly single digit numbers of daily infections for many, many months in many parts of their country. They did it. And they did it in ways that we never would. We're never, ever going to be a collective where we're actually concerned about the other 335 million people. It's just not going to happen. Um, it's mandatory to vote in Australia. Never going to happen here. You know, um, it's all kinds of things. But what they did, and they're one of a handful of countries, right? There's Singapore, Hong Kong, very notably South Korea, um, where um, uh, 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 action was taken, number one. Good digital app-driven contact tracing happened, right? These are things that we've blown off. This one, we couldn't help. Uh, but they have good, comprehensive, universal health care systems. Wow. How crazy. How failed socialist can you get? What a bunch of idiots. Wow. I can't, I, I, I can't take it much more. I got to fucking get out of here. This, this Fox TV nightmare of, of that, 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 that that's failure. That, that it's failure to tax major corporations and the ultra-rich 
and make that money be a big part of how your country is functional with 14 years of education, comprehensive health care, all that. How is that so crazy? And how did the Republicans convince people living in trailers, suffering with no health care, to vote for that shit? That's not all their voters, of course. They convince a lot of millionaires on, on Wall Street and imagine that they're millionaires that are in expensive Long Island homes and Highland Park, Chicago homes and L.A. homes and Atlanta homes. All around the country, they convince people who aren't ever going to be multimillionaires to vote like they are. I, I just don't. It's the most remarkable card game in history. But um, why I think it's important to look at an Australia, which which has, you know, uh, less than 10% of our population. I acknowledge that. And I acknowledge that it's easier to manage that. Of course, I'm not making a one-to-one. -one. They're somewhere around 25, 25, 26 million. We're, who knows, 330, 335 million. I don't know. But um, the, um, oops, I'm rolling over my new hoodie, which I will show you in a minute. Uh So since they do so much contact tracing and so much serious high-level testing of people throughout this whole thing, uh, this is a story that's alarming. And again, I'm gonna just not going to go through every word of it. But just know that these, this alarming outbreak that they've traced in Bondi, I believe is how you pronounce it, I thought it was Bondi. I've been to Bondi Beach, but I, I think I've been told it's Bondi. Yeah, mate, it's Bondi Beach. My Australian accent's not that good. But Bondi Beach, yeah. That's horrible. <laughs> it's like, what was that? Like, it's like broken Liverpool. Anyway, um, Bondi Junction, Westfield, and they've traced these cases to this fleeting contact. So I'll leave you with that. That's a new thing for your lexicon. Fleeting contact. I'm going to end on the most alarming, I think, part of my day here. Fleeting contact. That's what we have to think about. The, this new Delta variant is so intense in infectivity that you simply need fleeting contact. Fleeting contact. <sighs> that means just barely passing by someone and they just droplets, whether a cough, a sneeze, or a heavy sigh. And the, 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 if they happen to, you know, have a very moisturized uh, exhale, exhalation. The shit's getting crazy. So there's the Twitter stream of Dr. Eric. I'll leave you at that because it's too depressing to really sit here now and go any more depressing than I already have. So I'm going to get out of here. I'll, I'll really just drop that and please follow up on it because, again, it's it's a fact-based uh medical and epidemiological detective story of how they're tracing some of these new infections of the Delta. And these numbers are borne out by what's happening in Brazil, in many parts of Africa, in India. That's a fucking house on fire. In England and in places in the USA where there's low vaccination rates and they're turning up more and more of the Delta. But we're hardly testing. And it's already alarming. Imagine if we were all testing. The other thing we're not doing, we're not testing vaccinated people. I think we should. Then we would see, oh, wow, there's actually this large number. This is hy hypothetical. But we, we, I think, based on what's happening when you do test people, we'd possibly see this much higher rate than we thought of uh, asymptomatic infection. In other words, you have a vaccine. You're tested. Wow, you ha your your body's teeming with 
this variant or that variant, but you're not getting sick. Ah, that's the good news here. That's the good news. We know this now mathematically from our Israels, from our United States of Americas, from our Canada to a smaller degree, from our patchwork of European countries, which are still way behind in, in vaccination. Uh, Czech Republic, actually, much higher than some of the other countries. And we know that the vaccine suppresses infectivity, uh, 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 levels of illness if you do get infected, uh, bringing death down dramatically. And I got conspiracy people. There's a couple conspiracy people. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to name names, but there's like four of y'all that usually are here, and I'm not seeing you today. Maybe it's the holiday. But, um, you know, doesn't matter to you that, that 15 countries we can see, um, you know. Anyway, please read about this. Uh, pay attention to the Delta variant. I'll put a whole lot of money that just one week from now, I, I'll have just with a quick Google, six more alarming stories by next week. It's a speeding train. I mean, that's how biology works because we're not addressing it um, in the USA, especially. So, okay, a quick race through your last couple comments, and then I am out of here. I got a lot, a lot of work to do. I kind of ran over. Um, let's see. Kale Pesto, yes. Laura, can you freeze and mail us some Kale Pesto? Uh, sounds like a great gig. Yes. Oh, yeah, the gig I played. Yes, it really was a good way to break out. I have a gig coming up Sunday. Doesn't matter if you're not in Nashville, but I'm playing part of Modular on the Spot. Really honored to do that once again. More on that later. Uh, Sharon says, used to work at, okay, University of Minnesota. Wow, met Osterholm. That's great. Um, uh, Pasteur, early 20th century. Yeah, I, I think even, uh, yeah, I thought late 1890s, but not important. Um, I'm th not sure what that refers to, but um, uh, maybe I was talking about vaccinations, which go back to about 1796 with, um, I forget that doctor's name, um, English doctor. Anyway, cowpox is how he discovered, oh, wait a minute, tiny amounts of the infective pathogen can create immunity. And then, you know, Little did he know that 230 years later, uh, uh, a time-traveling Dr. Fauci had actually flown back to 1796 and planted the whole thing as a conspiracy. Uh, it, 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 no, he was brilliant. Y you guys didn't hear this. Y'all didn't hear this. I, it's true. I heard it from some guy. Here's how it worked. It has to do with cryptocurrency and Fauci and Gates. And the guy from uh, Elon Musk, right, who's pretending he's not into uh, cryptocurrency. Well, he's South African, see? So that connects to the Dutch, who were shipbuilders. Exactly. And that's how they were able to build a time travel machine, right? I mean, one leads to the other. They time traveled to, eight, to 1796 and got this doctor, the smallpox. I got to look this guy's name up. I always forget. Emerson was that his name? The smallpox doctor suddenly sees these people, but they dressed in period garb. So he didn't know they were really from not only the 2020, because it's Fauci, but they also were from the, the late 1950s because Jonas Salk was in on this. See? The whole polio thing. It, it, it's so easy. So they went back to 1796, and this guy's experimenting with cowpox. And and uh, and finds out oh it's this infective viral disease and and zoonotic it's jumping from cows to humans and um, the uh, the time travelers working for Fauci and Gates and Soros who kind of right he kind of got his people on the ride no one knew this see that's the wild card they convinced this guy that you know, use this stuff. It's called a vaccine. It'll help people. We know it's made in a lab. <laughs> and think about that. So this guy thinks that it's just other medical people 
doesn't realize when they disappear in this weird wooden time machine that the Dutch made because the Dutch, South Africa, and the dude from, uh, you know, Elon Musk. I, right? I mean, it just fits together. So jump ahead a few years, and we're all using this smallpox vaccine, which really isn't because Fauci made it. Oh, try to keep up. And, and, and the polio thing, same thing. Jonas Salk, look his family up. They're millionaires. How else could it? So, so it, folks, you just got to try harder. This stuff is easy once you factor in time machines, the Dutch, Elon Musk being from South Africa, the Boers, uh, 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 you know, uh, Soros' grand, great-grandfather, and the whole Gates thing. I, I'm really a little puzzled that uh, that this is Edward Jenner. That's his name. Okay, so it's Edward Jenner. He's the guy who met the time machine. Try to keep up people working for Gates and Soros and Elon Musk. That's as simple as I can put it as I wrap up. You can look that other stuff up, but, you know. Anyway, um, here we go. Uh, last minute. Have I ever been to Ghana on, on tour? No, have not. Um, only been there. Born there, left at five, went back at... When did I visit first? I went back at... Uh, I don't know, uh, 35 years later, left in like 76 and never went back till 2016 or something, family reunion. My dear dad died and I went again in 2019. So I've been a paltry amount of my life there, which is a drag, a beautiful place uh, with all its problems. Never done any music there. I have been on tour in South America um, in uh, – actually – in Venezuela, in 1991, 30 years ago, doing lectures, two or three little lectures at a school on Earth Day. I was flown down there by a friend who's a teacher, and uh, I, I went to speak about – thanks for reminding me. I went to speak about animal agriculture and, were, and uh, Earth Day. Yeah, in April of 1991 – I really wish you know we had some of this shit recorded, but yeah, April 1991, 1991, 30 years ago plus, there I was, my first trip to Caracas, Venezuela. Um, we were warned, stay in the hotel. It was bad then. But but at a, at a private school with, with a couple thousand kids, I gave a couple lectures and workshops on how we have to address animal agriculture. We have to be looking. Folks... By 1992, the rainforest will have da 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 destruction because we knew these numbers. I was saying this stuff. I was saying, uh, uh, folks, from the stuff I'm reading, by 1993, the American Midwest, all of these things came true. All of these things came true. We kept destroying the rainforest, actually even at a faster rate, not only in Amazon but in parts of Asia, and we we, we destroyed. The, the the beyond the calculated amount of of um arable land in the midwest california the droughts that were predicted here we are so in 1991 i was i don't know what the word is um some of you might say just as much of a jerk as you are now andre and that's fine the horses for courses i don't really care but enough of you will say wow you you, you you were concerned about this 30 years ago. Yeah, I was 35 years ago, 37 years ago. Um, and I was attempting to learn and attempting to approach it in a scholastic manner, in a scientific manner, in a fact-based manner, in a paper trail manner. So that's when I've been in South America. Um, Caracas, jump ahead at, uh, about 15 years, and that's when I went there for music, went to Chile, Santiago, Chile, with Al Demiola. And then jump uh, another 13 years to 2019 when I really finally got to tour ar ar around um, Brazil, Uruguay, Paraguay, Peru, Chile again. Uh, I might be forgetting one. But um, love it. Love my home continent. 
really, really craving a visit there. And uh, maybe get the fuck out there. <laughs> you never know. Okay, so, uh, Bassam, you're right. What about Biden's son? <laughs> you're, the, you're the best, bro. I know. Who is problematic, but not as problematic as some other shit. So, Hillary's email. Okay, cool. I've reached the f- the finish line. As I, uh, my new thing is to not miss anyone's comments. So, um, thanks, y'all. Please, if 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 you, if there's only one thing you you click on this, it's Dr. Eric Feig- Feigl Ding, and his thread on what's happening, not only globally but specifically the detective work they just did for this Australian case. Ooh, boy. Ending on a positive note, we've got uh, 45, 47% of, of, of uh, what is it, 110 million Americans? I, I, I don't track it every single day, so correct me if I'm wrong, but somewhere on the order of, and if you know that term, if you've been educated in math and science and things like that, that's a phrase we use, which just means, you know, five figures in the mid, so it means, you know, 45,000 to, you know, 61,000, you know, somewhere. That's what, you know, mid five figures would mean. Uh, low six figures, that means, yeah, just over 100,000. It's not, I'm, I'm, hopefully I'm not being condescending, but to some people that's new new language. So it's, you know, but, but somewhere on the order of 46, 48% of Americans, uh, um, obviously over 12, we're, we're not vaccinating under 12 yet. Um, so that's good. We can go all day on the horror of vaccines. Please, conspiracy theory people, give me a little respect. I'm not happy about vaccines. I'm happy that in a fucking shit show, nightmare, burning airline, flying into an earthquake during a hurricane, fucking biological shit show, that we have... Just something that, that that can poke holes in this thing. Wow, you're annoying. Acting like uh, something hasn't killed three million human beings at an alarming rate. Because then you say absolute bullshit like, well, three million people would have died anyway, Andre. I mean, come on. Don't be a sheep. This is three million extra who... We could go through and parse some had heart disease, lung disease, but they said that from the beginning. And if you were being intellectually honest, which you're not, because you started out comparing it to the flu, if you were being honest, then the 45, 50, 60,000 flu deaths uh, per year in the U.S. are also (laughs) largely people with pre-existing problems. But you don't care because then that would mean being honest about the crazy shit video that your clueless pal sent you. But the flu deaths, you know, when you die of flu in those tens of thousands of people, it's more dangerous for the elderly, for the obese and diabetic and people with emphysema and various lung issues, people with chronic bronchitis and bronchial things, uh, people with suppressed immunity. Oh, wow, the same exact list that we knew by New Year's Eve 2019 were getting a, 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 a higher rate of, of, of problems. We knew this already. It wasn't even 2020 yet, and we knew this because in China, South Korea, Hong Kong, Singapore, Australia, just a bit, and New Zealand, just a bit, they were starting to say, hmm, something, this is not a good virus. Um, all right, folks, I've rambled a bit, but hopefully in there you picked up a thread and uh, <laughs> uh, just please go look up this Eric Feigl Ding guy and, um, you know, to be continued. Uh, next week, if Laura Darda can make it, we'll have a chef. We'll talk about dessert. We'll talk about vegan 
cream cheese and how to make dressings. And, and uh, <laughs> I promise for those of you who have hung in today um, to a, a peripheral issue, which this this is about quitting the military industrial slash meat uh, uh, animal slaughter uh, um, uh, um, uh, um, military industrial style. I'm not connecting the Pentagon to your hamburger, but I mean um, that, 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 that scale of industrialization and mechanization, um, it is related to a number of these outbreaks, including this one, and I wanted to spend time today pointing you to a bunch of sources where they're warning us that this is going to keep happening and could be way worse if we keep pushing the envelope on animals and their habitat and their natural wildlife surroundings and the flora and the fauna that fit together in these ecosystems that we just keep mowing down uh we got to wake up. Have a good day, folks. Uh, we'll see you soon. And as promised, here's my new hoodie. Just got this on blowout from Moog down at the Moog headquarters. Beautiful. It's got a Moog logo, and it says synthesizer in a funny manner around a, a stylized kind of a sine wave that's also an S. Anyway. There we have it. Talk to you soon. Thanks for 